different from iron limitation and different from phosphorus limitation. So let's take a, another look here. If I can get this to switch here. Let's compare now between the high CO2 adapted cultures. So here's the ones grown at 750 or 800 ppm here. And we'll compare across these treatments. Here's the same Venn diagram treatment. You can see, again, you still have a lot of unique proteins that are upregulated in the co-limited ones. But now the iron limited ones are going crazy. 35 proteins upregulated, 17 downregulated. There's an interaction between iron and CO2 going on here that doesn't happen at low CO2. And even in phosphorus limitation, we have twice as many downregulated proteins at high CO2 as at low CO2. So we have some very interesting interactions between CO2 adaptation and iron and phosphorus limitation going on at the cellular level. Oops. Doesn't want to switch here. Hmm. There we go. Sorry about that. So let's, for the last comparison, let's compare the high CO2 cultures here to the low CO2 cultures. We call this the transitions from low to high CO2. So what kind of differential expression do we see comparing this way? Well, this is a complicated Venn diagram because there's more <laughs> treatments, but I'll walk you through it here. Let's look at the uh, iron limited ones are now expressing 21 upregulated and 15 downregulated. The, uh, oh, there they are. The phosphorus limited ones are now have 21 downregulated ones, and the iron phosphorus ones have 26 upregulated proteins in the high CO2 relative to the low CO2 ones. So just to summarize, we're still working on this. Um, it's new data that Nate just presented at ASLO. Under present day CO2, iron limitation by itself only changes a few unique proteins that are differentially expressed. But under high CO2, there's a whole suite of them that are different. For phosphorus limitation, the main response is downregulation. But there are, there's a lot more that are downregulated at high CO2 than at low CO2. And again, when you look at the weird co-limited cells that are happier being co-limited than limited by either phosphorus or iron, they have their own set of proteins that are being expressed uniquely under those conditions. And right now, we're looking in those boxes to see what those proteins are. Some of them are things you would expect to see under iron and phosphorus limitation. Others are not. But I will show you the results for one because it's cool. I like it. This is an EZRA, which controls cell size in bacteria. Remember I told you they got miniaturized in the iron and phosphorus co-limited ones? They are expressing this protein which miniaturizes bacteria. If they're not expressing that, they get bigger. And sure enough, that protein is being highly expressed. This is a spectral counts over here, just relative expression, uh, in the iron and phosphorus co-limited treatments. So that fits with what we've observed. So just to wind up, what are the net effects going to be when you put high CO2 uh, moving into the ocean ecosystems that are already limited by iron and or phosphorus? Well, I don't claim to know the answer to that, but it's not simple. We're still figuring it out. But what I can tell you is that simple Liebig-type experiments looking at limitation of one thing at a time are not giving us the right answer. These, there are unique responses of these organisms to combinations of factors 
that differ a lot from the responses to each factor individually. Iron limitation and phosphorus limitation each have a unique way of interacting with these high CO2 adapted cell lines. And iron and phosphorus elicits another completely different set of responses. So there's a lot of things that we can do and that we don't know, but they look interesting. What are we doing? This is what we're still working on and we'll be working on for the next few years. We're looking at the methylome, that's the, all the methylated DNA. Never been reported in a, in a, a cyanobacterium before we think. We want to know what's the role of epigenetic DNA methylation um, in cyanobacteria and their responses to environmental change, both CO2 and, and other things, because it's a new, a new thing that we've discovered that goes beyond just CO2. We are looking at the genome. So far, we haven't seen any smoking gun that explains these changes, but Nate and uh, Eric Webb are looking at every type of uh, DNA change mutation you can think of. They're looking transposons. Both these uh, groups have are littered, their genomes littered with transposons. They have point mutations. They have insertions and deletions, uh, amplifications. But so far, we've, we've sequenced these, but we have not seen, other than this epigenetic change, we have not seen anything that is common to all the cell lines that, uh, that, that exhibit this uh, common phenotype. We're also doing experimental evolution studies with other nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria. So we have a new graduate student, Mike Lee, who's doing crocospheric, because we'd like to see if it gets stuck in the fast lane, too, when you, uh, when you adapt it to high CO2. And we're continuing to look at how adaptation to high CO2 interacts with limiting nutrients like iron and phosphorus. Obviously, there's a lot of still unanswered questions that we need to look at there. And finally, we are not funded to do this, but I would like to do it. I'd like to get out, and potentially we're going to be able to find some markers for some of these things that we can look for in natural populations of nitrogen fixers. I want to get out on the ship and look at populations in the real ocean, not just in our bottles do some manipulative experiments on the ship, but also just look in situ and see if we can see gradients in these responses as we say cross from a high iron area to a low iron area. With that, I will give some acknowledgments. So these are my collaborators and co-PIs, Fei Xiu Fu, my wife, who's the culture wizard who's grown all these cultures for seven years now without losing them. Eric Webb and Max Saito are my co-PIs. Al uh, did those, that model I showed you. These are the students that have been involved in it. Nate Walworth, as I said, a lot of what I showed you is his work. Mike is just getting started, but he has some promising results already. Jasmine is an undergraduate who's doing some of this work and has been on a couple of papers already for it. And of course, we can't forget the people who write us the check, all right? Thank you. That's a really good question. I mean, that's the kind of stuff Lenski can do. He can take his ancestors uh, that he's cryopreserved out and compete against them. Unfortunately, Trico can't be cryopreserved. But we could compete it against stock cultures that have been growing at 380 the whole time. And we have talked we'd love to do that. But we have to find some unique genetic marker for the adapted ones, or we're not going to be able to know who's winning. They all look like little trichomes in the bottle. So we're, we would like to find a way to distinguish between them. Um, and maybe with some of the omics that we're doing, we can pull out something. We were hoping that genomics was going to give us a unique marker that would also might give us a clue if there's been some change in gene expression. And, but 
We haven't found anything yet, but uh, we'd love to do that. It's a great idea. Yeah. I'm supposed to be repeating your question for people who aren't here at the other end. Uh, natural populations at high CO2, I'd like to find some. I don't know of any places to find trichodesmium or other nitrogen fixtures that have been growing naturally, maybe calderas. Would, I'd love to talk to you about it. If you have an idea where I can find some, it, it would be very interesting to do, yeah. We have not, but some of them appear to fold up very nicely in, if you'd use these little uh, folding software, uh, very, very nicely into perfectly good non-coding RNAs. Maybe some of them are viral in origin. We have not looked in that much detail. Um, Nate's paper is out in PNAS. I can send it to you. Yeah. Well, it's an evolutionary term in these, uh, uh, these experimental evolution things. Ancestral is simply the culture that you started the experiment with. That's the ancestor of your selected strains. Not, with, not that we're going back to the, the Archean and, and grabbing the, yeah. Yeah, I, that would be interesting to do too. If you have ideas about that, let me know. I'd <laughs> That's right. That's right. So they've been through a lot of uh, changes, even more recently, the, the glacial interglacial cycles, right? But not, not, at that level. not at that level, yeah. Well, my understanding and I'm not an expert on cyanobacteria evolution, but trichodesmium is relatively recently uh, evolved, and, but crocosphere is much more ancient um, if you, if you uh, um, do the molecular clock in, in, on these, uh, these two species. That's my understanding. Um, so trichodesmium may not have been around then. I, I would have to find out. I don't know for sure. So you think uh, they got stuck in, in yeah, I, uh, it's hard for me to believe that that would persist for 100 million years, but it's persisted for two years in our culture, so as long as we can keep it going, yeah. I'll have to talk to my program manager about extending the project a little bit, yeah. Yeah, Bob? Well, that's a good question. Right. I think that the differences in speciation between your experimental conditions and the natural environment might be important. That's always an issue when you're doing culture work. So I'll answer the first part first. We used, uh, for, we used aquil, which is a defined uh, culture medium that Francois Morel and Bill Sunda developed. Um, so we know what the trace metal chemistry, I was trained as a trace metal uh, biologist. So we grew trace metal clean cultures in, an, in a defined trace metal medium. Um, I believe the total iron concentrations were 450 nanomolar in high iron and 10 nanomolar in the low limiting ones. Now those are a lot higher than environmental levels of iron, but that's not the free iron. I'd have to look that up. Um, and necessarily in a culture, you have to increase uh, levels above the, the background levels you see because your, your cell density is much higher than in the ocean. But it's always a caveat, and that's one reason we would like to get out and look at some cells in the real world as well. Now that we think we have some ideas of what to look for and what they might be doing, we need to take this to the ocean. Yeah, I agree. I do like to get out of culture bottles sometime, even though I didn't talk about it today. So. Yes.
right around here, you're in the, you're in the pathway of, of those storms. I know, that's a, that's a, that makes for a nice system around here to look for fluctuations in, in iron availability. I agree, yeah. Yeah, Rob? And you for most of the last few million years, <laughs> they were living in an ocean that had half the PPS2 we probably have right now, right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and a bit more iron. Um, so what do you think the overall implications were for just the food production in the ocean? Just supporting the, the base of the food chain? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure I can answer that, but our results would suggest that changes in iron coming into the ocean uh, on, say, glacial, interglacial cycles would affect uh, nitrogen fixation. That's not our idea. That's been around a long time. Um, changes in CO2 could definitely ratchet that up and down. And actually, uh, I mean, you can wave your arms and uh, look at some of this stuff. I think I have a slide here. Those used to be your children. So, oops, I lost it. They're still my children, but it's not my data. I'm not, I don't want to go back and do that. But uh, if you look at some of Danny Sigmund's work with foraminiferal isotope uh, levels, he claims there was reduced nitrogen fixation in the uh, in the at the last glacial maximum. Whether you believe that or not, it, it does correlate with our data. Um, so there, there you, can, you can wave your arms any way you want, but, but so many things are changing at once. And as I showed at the end, interactions between iron and CO2 and phosphorus can give you a completely different answer. So I think we could sit down and drink like six or eight beers tonight and try to figure that out. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what were the phosphate Boy, you guys want the whole medium recipe, don't you? <laughs> uh, I think we used 20 micromolar for replete and either one or two micromolar. Although you saw on those uh, gradient uh, experiments, we went much lower down to like 0.1 or even lower, um, which again is much higher than you see in the ocean. But necessarily, you have to have higher, as I just mentioned, higher concentrations than you'd see in the ocean. Um, you can see from those growth rates, we were successful in iron limiting them and phosphorus limiting them. We're, we're, we do this stuff a lot. We, we do know how to do that. Yeah. Also, uh, presumably, with, with the high CO2 world, you're limiting the, the, uh, uh, the temperature. Good question. And we have looked at um, temperature response curves. We just, uh, my wife published a, a paper in uh, aquatic microbial ecology last year. We took that same set of culture isolates I showed you, and we grew them across a big range of temperature and, and uh, measured all of their nitrogen fixation and growth rates. And interestingly enough, all that variability we see relative to CO2, you don't see it in their thermal responses. All the trichodesmium have the same curve from all over the world. All of the crocosphere from all over the world have the same temperature response curve. So it, it's, it's genus specific, but within the genus, we do not see all that variability we saw relative to CO2, which is interesting. I think that the same strains can have some kind of local or adaptation or historical adaptation for CO2, but in terms of temperature, they all look just the same. And sorry, I can't show you. I don't want to go through the whole thing. You can look at my daughter. That's Melissa and that's Lucas. But I can't show you any more data here because I lost it. Yeah. Good question, and we did look at that. Um, we went back to the uh, Takahashi's uh, climatology for, for CO2, and there's no obvious correlation. Actually, some of the ones that had very high uh, 
half saturation constants were growing in areas with relatively low uh, CO2. But the environmental range of CO2 variability they experience in the modern ocean today is much smaller than the range we grew them over. They never see 2,000 ppm, and they probably never see 50 ppm either. So they're right, or the, you know, the surface ocean isn't that far out of equilibrium with the atmosphere. So there's a small range all over the ocean, but there's a big range in their responses, which makes me think that what we're seeing is a memory of some past event where they got stuck like our cultures did. That's my suggestion anyways, my hypothesis. Yeah. Another good question, and that's why we are growing them under iron and phosphorus limitation, because if they're growing faster, they need more of the limiting nutrients. And it could actually be a liability to be forced to grow faster in a nutrient-limited ocean. Um, it's a good question. There has to be a cost, and there has to be a reason that they're not all growing gangbusters out there from the past uh, high CO2 stand. And I think it's because you know, it's not a good thing to grow faster than the environment will support in terms of fluxes of things that you need, like iron and phosphorus. Um, but we need to look at that more and, and quantify what the real costs are. We were just surprised to see it at all. It should, they shouldn't do that. Ask Maya. She says yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's, it's thought that it lowers the oxygen around the cells that are actually doing the nitrogen fixation with high respiration rates. There's some different ideas about that, yeah. But it, it, has, it has to do something to protect its nitrogenase since it's fixing it during photosynthetic oxygen evolution. And there's, that's, I think, kind of the leading uh, idea is that nitrogen fixation is only happening in certain cells along the filament and that, uh, that they crank up their respiration rates to consume oxygen fast enough to protect the nitrogenase. But there have been other ideas too. If I was thinking that, it might, that, that there might be a, a size limitation on that process. Yeah, maybe. But I don't think we know that. But yeah, that would be interesting to look at. Mm-hmm. 